Um, and Abby, if, if you could help us sort of monitor the chat room as we go, we would really appreciate it. Um, so, you know, our organization, DRG, we're a talent advisory group. We work exclusively with nonprofits and we help them address every challenge that they have as it relates to people. Um, all of us on this call have done a lot of work with organizations on compensation, helping organizations to develop strategy to do so with equity and inclusion in, in mind, um, and to really, and also to do so in partnership with their teams and their staff. And so we're excited to share a little bit about what we've learned to um, answer your questions and to help advance your own thinking on these topics. So uh, my name is Lori Clement, Senior Talent Advisor. I'm gonna um, give Shaquille and Omar an and our colleague Jen who is here and give them all an opportunity to introduce themselves. Hi everyone, I'm Shaquille Koons, a talent consultant here at DRG. Uh, happy to be here with you today and excited to answer all of your questions. Hey everybody, Omar Lopez, talent consultant with DRG, and I'm similarly very excited to be with you all today. And Jen, I'm not sure if you're able to. Uh, I think Jen needs to be elevated to uh, panelist, and um, and then I think so. Jen will uh, chime in a little bit. She's also already chimed in in the chat, but Jen okay. is um, our client engagement specialist and all around badass. So uh, <laughs> if you're looking for a contact after this, definitely reach out uh, to Jen for more information uh, after today's webinar. Perfect, perfect. And Jen has already introduced herself in the chat. Um, we invite all of the attendees to introduce themselves as well. You know, if you could share your name, if you're comfortable sharing what organization you're with, you know, please do. Um, it, it should support and sort of building community and, and having conversations as we move forward. So what we're gonna do next is we're gonna talk you through the agenda, give you a sense of what to expect, right? So um, we're gonna talk about compensation, um, walk through an understanding of what compensation strategy is and what it isn't, and what some great characteristics of compensation strategy are. We're also going to drill down and talk a bit about internal and external equity as it relates to compensation, help us all to get a strong understanding of that, as well as transparency, which has become a really hot button topic within organizations and institutions. And you know, many staff are asking for transparency. Um, and, and so we're gonna unpack what does that mean in this context? We're also going to talk about um, sort of the part that everybody really cares about is, you know, how do you go about developing and structuring a compensation package. Um, and then we're gonna share, you know, just best practices and lessons that we've learned along the way, working with nonprofits of different sizes across the country. Um, and we invite you as we go through to ask your questions. Um, we have time at the end dedicated to those questions. You know, if, if we're able to see them as we move through, we'll do our best to answer them um, as we go along. And Abby, we'd love your help with that. Um, because we want to make sure that we don't miss anything. So that's the plan. Um, if there are other topics that you're like, oh, I wish we were covering that, chat about that in the, in the chat. And if there's time at the end, we'll go into it. Um, so there's one, one thing, um, you know, before, before we dive into the information, um, you know, I wanted to describe a scenario for you. Uh, to think about and consider as we talk about all of these topics. And so, you know, one of those scenarios is, you know, uh, you know, some time ago, we started working with an organization, we'll call them sort of company X. And, you know, they came to us because um, their compensation information had been revealed. One of their executives accidentally left it, um, left their sort of compensation structure, who was getting paid what uh, on the copy machine. And someone else found that and shared it across the organization. And as you can imagine, it led to a lot of questions. Um, and there were questions about sort of why, some, why one person was compensated one way and somebody else with a similar title had different compensation. Um, and um, as you can imagine, there was a lot of chatter and conversation, you know, both among peers and then also, you know, with and to the leadership team. And so, you know, as we go through this information and we're talking about and learning about compensation, I'd love for you to think about, you know, if this were your organization, what would you do? 
And we'll circle back to this um, towards the end of our discussion to have a conversation around that. So without further ado, let's get started. So we're gonna talk about, um, first we wanna talk about just what is compensation, right? Um, many people think that this is just, you know, your salary, but it's more than that. It's essentially all of the offerings that your organization is giving to your team members. And so it's a combination of, for the most part, um, salary and benefits, right? Um, and this is often called total compensation. You might also hear people refer to it as total rewards. Um, and benefits like pay can vary across organizations and even within organizations. There are many organizations that have different tiers of benefits um, that are available to mid or senior level employees. And then the way that you structure salary and pay can also vary. It takes into account things like stipends and bonuses and things of that nature, which, which apply to different roles at different times. Um, but ideally, an organization's total compensation is something that allows them to be competitive in the marketplace, and it's something that is tailored to the needs of the people that you are employing. And I think that's key, because as we think about compensation um, and ultimately developing a structure that works, you know, we need to think about a multitude of audiences. One is we need a structure that works for the people who we're serving. Um, and, and that being your employees. And we, we need a structure and, and also not just sort of collectively, but also thinking about the individuals. And then we also need a structure and an approach that thinks about the landscape and the market that you exist in um, and making sure that your organization is best positioned to be as competitive as possible there. So we're gonna move to the next slide and I wanna get your thoughts on uh, compensation strategy. Right, so for those of you who have phones with a camera feature or any device that has a QR code reader, um, go ahead and, and scan the QR code you see on the screen and it's gonna bring you to a poll question. We'll give you some time to do that, right? Um, and so the poll question is, when you think of compensation strategy, what words and or phrases come to mind? And if you could take a moment, we'll give everybody a moment to, to scan the QR code, take that picture with your phone, and then um, have a moment to write your answer to that question. When you think of compensation strategy, what words and or phrases come to mind? So we'll give you a moment to do that. And if you leave that screen open after you type that in, that would be great because um, in a moment, we'll show you all of your responses and it will show you on your device. And my colleague Omar is running that. So Omar, you've got your eye on that. Uh, you let us know when we think we've heard from everybody. And I think we have 14 people, uh, let's see, maybe 11 people that we wanna get responses from. We're pretty close. Pretty close, okay. We'll give everyone That's, a few more minutes. We've got, we've got eight in so far. Eight in so far, who's missing? And if, and if you're having um, technical difficulties, you have a question, you maybe type that in the chat, maybe we can help you with it. And if you're not able to answer it, you can feel free to also, you know, type your response to that question in the chat. And I'll say the rest, the, I'll read the question for you. It's when you think of compensation strategy, what words and or phrases come to mind? And you know what? If you don't want to answer or you can't answer or you're like, Lori, I need like 10 minutes to answer this and you're not going to wait that long. I get that, too. I get that, too. So um, how about we give it another minute, Omar, and then you refresh. Yep, we've got nine in. OK, let's do it. Let's see what those nine say. And Omar, I don't have this on my phone. So if you could talk, if you could just give us a summary of what you see there, that would be great. Sure. Just one sec. Oh, 
we could see it on the screen. I didn't know that. All right, we've got ourselves a word cloud. Benefits. When you think of compensation strategy, benefits is large. So I assume that all of you use that word in your response. I see quality of life, salary benefits and time off, employee empowerment. That's a good one. Job title ranges. That's good. Value proposition, proposition intentional transparency. Like that. We're going to talk about that. Retention, equitable pay. Money, I'm surprised money is not bigger. I mean, if it was me, it would have been money, 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 money all day. Um, so I totally get that. Equity, decisions, daunting. Okay, claps for somebody being vulnerable and saying the real thing. This work is daunting. It's meaningful to everyone. Everybody has skin in the game in your organization on this work. They're all gonna have an opinion and it's hard to please that many people. So daunting. I 100% I applaud that. Um, and then I hear somebody saying bosses, job bans, you know, really good, really good list here. So thank you all for sharing. Um, so what compens, let's talk about like, essentially compensation strategy describes how pay and benefits are structured and aligns the values of your organization with your policies and practices. Right. So let's talk about and take a look at what are the characteristics of a great compensation strategy. Um, and so I would say, sort of first and foremost, um, a great compensation strategy is one that's aligned with your organizational values, goals, and objectives. And so if we unpack that and look at values, one thing that I'd like to remind organizations is that sometimes the values we have for our organization differ from the values that we have around compensation. And it's worthwhile to have conversations to understand what those distinctions are, right? Um, and it, it may be that your organizational values absolutely align, uh, but not always is it clear how the organizational values translate to compensation values. And so there's a need to really define that um, when you're developing a compensation strategy. The other thing I would say is that there's a need to also understand your how your team values compensation. Um, and so part of the reason why we have flexible and fluid up there is because this is work that doesn't end. Um, your team is con constantly shifting, the dynamics are, the marketplace that you're in is, and so, you know, you, you yourself have, have strategies and plans that last for finite periods of time. You know, the direction your organization is going in shifts. And so there's a need to revisit this constantly um, and to check in with those different audiences and with the organization and with the current leadership team to really identify well, what are our values as it relates to um, as it relates to compensation. You know, if you value equity, is that obvious? and the strategy that you've developed. If you value family or balance or wellness, is that clear in the benefits that you offer and the financial contributions that you make um, toward those benefits, right? Um, you know, when you think about organizational goals, you know, broadly speaking, you wanna make sure that your compensation strategy aligns with your programmatic impact, you know, and financial goals and objectives, right? Um, and, you know, you want to determine whether or not uh, there's a way to tie compensation directly to those goals, both for individuals and for the team as a whole. And then specific to salary, you know, there are questions to think about in terms of, you know, where you want to be in the marketplace, right? Um, is your goal to be at or above the 50th percentile? Um, how often do you review the, the marketplace and the landscape to see exactly where you're positioned. Um, and every organization is on a different spectrum there. We have some clients who, you know, their goal is to be at the 25th percentile and that's what works for their budget and the work that they do. And they have high levels of retention, even though I would say that this is a relatively low target for competitiveness in the market, right? So those are some things to consider. Um, you know, the other thing to consider is that you want a compensation strategy that is going to allow the organization to be responsive to the budget 
uh, and the financial landscape that they can find themselves in. Essentially, what can the organization afford? Um, I would say with unlimited resources, we would all be on the same page as it relates to compensation, but that unfortunately is not the case, right? There are realities that we have to adhere to. And so um, the compensation strategy should be clear on what the budget is in order to, to allocate funds effectively and fairly. Um, and and, and to, you know, to be realistic about what's possible and then to also communicate that to your teams as well so that they understand that. Um, and so, you know, you know, there's some organizations that may want to provide, you know, a high level of benefits and sort of medical coverage and offer paid paternity and maternity leave as an example. Uh, but if you don't have enough money to cover that, uh, and to do that equitably for everyone, then it's not possible, right? And so you have to think about what are some other ways that we can, can reach our goals that might not have the same financial impacts. Uh, I see something's happening with the screen, uh, but it looks like we're back. Um, other things to consider that are great characteristics of a compensation strategy is, um, is that the strategy supports internal and external equity. And we're gonna talk about this a lot more. Um, my colleague Shaq is gonna talk about that with you in a few minutes. Um, but you know, just to get you started on your thinking here, when we think about internal equity, we're talking about um, compensation being fair within the organization, right? So we're wanting our colleagues to say, you know, compared to my peers who have similar respons responsibility and authority, I'm compensated fairly, right? So that's what we want to think about when we think of internal equity. And when we're looking externally, we want to have the same conversation, but external to the organization. So we want our colleagues to be able to say, when I am compensated fairly, when compared to peers doing similar work, at similar organizations, right? Um, and so that's one frame for it to help you think about, you know, how do we structure a great compensation strategy? And then you want it to be something that, that people understand, right? And so it needs to be clear um, and transparent. And we're gonna, we're gonna dive into transparency. I think Omar's gonna talk to us about that. Um, but essentially you wanna make sure everybody understands your philosophy, your policies, your practices, your rationale for that, how that aligns again to sort of the first thing here, values, goals, and objectives. And so, you know, there's a lot of thought to be put into what do you share? How do you share it? When, with whom, and how often, right? And so there's a whole communication strategy that goes into this um, to making sure that, that people understand it, are bought into it, are happy with it. Um, and as I, I started off saying, this is work that doesn't end. It's not the type of work that you say, great, I've done it. Sending an email to everyone, you've got the information you need. No, it's, it's an ongoing conversation. Um, and to do this work right, you know, ideally it's, it's something that you're visiting you know, every other year. Um, and you know, potentially each year, you know, doing an analysis to see where you are and then reporting on that to your team, to letting, letting them know, you know where things stand, how you plan to move forward in the future, um, and, and, you know, if you're not so great in some places, being transparent about that as well. Um, so enough from me. I'm going to pass it on to Shaquille, who's going to talk you. to us about internal and external equity. Yeah, so let, let's dig into this a little bit deeper. Um, as Lori said, your compensation strategy does need to be equitable both um, from an internal perspective and also externally. Um, but what exactly does that mean? Um, Laura did say that you know, internal equity is, is fair compensation as compared to others within the organization, but how do you even determine that? Um, well, the first step is to make sure that everyone has access to the same opportunities. So uh, you could pay everyone uh, with the same title, at the same level in the organization, totally equitably. But if women or people of color aren't even considered for those roles or aren't adequately represented in those roles, you really wouldn't have received, um, achieved equity. Um, if we assume that that has already been addressed, um, now we start looking at compensation. And some things that we need to consider there are around um, the role. So typically that's included in the job description, but those are often out of date, especially, you know, a year, two years, three years 
15 years after you started, um, and those, those don't always get updated. Uh, level of authority and responsibility. So again, this is typically inherent in the role and the job description, but it's not always the case. So you may want to think about what you're asking or expecting people uh, to do that isn't reflected in their job description. Um, you also want to consider the necessary and relevant skills and experience for roles. So some things really do impact uh, one's ability to step into and fill a role, and those should be taken into consideration. Um, but if someone has, you know, a much higher level of education, is that person, um, you know, with the experience really in the same role as someone without the experience or vice versa? So you need to consider that. Um, demographics. Obviously, we want um, individuals that are in the same or very similar roles with the same or very similar skills um, and level of authority or responsibility to be get, getting compensation um, compensated regularly, equitably, um, regardless of their gender, their race, their ability, disability, et cetera. Um, so if someone's doing the same job as someone else, those two people need to be compensation, uh, compensated equitably. And then location. So we're gonna talk about this a little bit um, more in a few minutes, but some organizations do adjust for location um, and some nonprofits do not. Uh, and this is becoming much trickier uh, since COVID. Um, so we'll come back to this in a second. And then um, third, when, when assessing equity in compensation, you really do need to think about total compensation and re rewards. So you should think about it as, as broadly as you can. Um, you know, looking at both pay and then um, traditional benefits, you know, your PTO, your medical, dental, vision, um, but also thinking deeper. So uh, does everyone have the resources they need to do their job? Um, this is becoming more of an issue now that people are working from home. Um, so do they have the right technology? Do they have a fast enough internet speed to sustain um, video calls all the time? Do they have, you know, a proper desk set up or space in their in their house they can work um, and succeed well. Do you offer you know mental health or wellness benefits? Those are also uh, things that have you know value and that you can include in your total compensation package. Um, and then uh, finally, really attending to fair compensation internally starts at hiring. So. Is your salary fixed or is negotiation allowed? Um, if you allow negotiation, is there a range that you use? Um, so if, if two people come in with similar skills, experience, responsibility, and one negotiates and one doesn't, are those two people being compensation, compensated differently or similarly? Um, you also have to consider in our world whether uh, benefits are usable. So um, sometimes, you know, health insurance is very location specific. And if someone's outside of that location, it, it can, can be hard to be in network with, with your new insurance company. Um, so you really just need to consider, um, you know, what, what all are the criteria that you're using to determine salaries? Who's making those decisions? Um, you know, are decisions based on metrics? Are they the supervisor's discretion? Um, and if, it's the latter. Uh, how do you ensure that supervisors are applying the same standards and treating similar employees similarly? So we mentioned location. Um, and historically, uh, local and regional organizations have benchmarked compensation uh, to their peers in the geographic area, um, which makes sense because you want to consider you know, the cost of living and the definition of a living wage in that area, even if, you know, you're compensating very generously, you want to know where that, where that line is. Um, and national organizations have really had to um, use either different pay scales, you know, at different offices or different locations. Um, but the main uh, issue that happens is when someone moves. So um, this has always been a question, and it's an area where we recommend that organizations have a policy. But with the, the pandemic, it has exponentially increased the need um, for these policies and to really understand what, um, what the 
policy is when someone moves. So some examples of what um, organizations and companies are doing today in the post-COVID world um, are some companies are continuing to pay based on geography. And then if someone moves, they are adjusting their salary. So um, Google, for example, is lowering people's salaries at, when they move to more or less expensive areas. So if they're moving from, you know, San Francisco Bay Area to small town in Indiana, they are adjusting their wages. Um, other organizations are beginning to pay according to the value the position provides to the organization, and they're not considering cost of living, um, which may be, you know, counter counterintuitive to some of you, but if you think more broadly about cost of living, um, it's not just dependent on, you know, location, um, but you could also include family size, um, you know, and some people don't have a choice of where they live or not. Um, so if they're taking care of, you know, young children or their parents or older um, people that they are responsible for, this impacts cost of living. Health status and medical needs impact cost of living. Transportation options impact cost of living. So um, it's really, it's not an easy question to answer at all. Um, and it's one that more and more organizations are dealing with and having to consider. Um, so we are going to shift gears a little bit to um, external equity here in a second, but we, I think, have a slide for you before that. It's open now, so folks can uh, use the same link uh, if you want to okay. uh, um, stay on the same page on your phone. And there's now a new question on there for you. I I am not seeing the Slido screen, but that could be my internet uh, lagging. Sure. Yeah. And just in case, just in case someone didn't leave it open or closed out of it. Absolutely. Here you go. Thank you. So I'll read the question just for those people who don't have you know, a QR code reader. So the question we're asking is how often do you benchmark your salaries or your salary bands against those at other organizations? Um, and then the choices are biannually, annually, every two years, every three to five years, I've never done this or none of the above. We have eight answers in so far. Wait another minute for one okay. more in case one more person wants to chime in. Awesome. And then we'll share the results. Great. Okay. And here are our results. Okay. So it looks like 44% every three to five years. And then second place, I've never done this. So honestly, um, these are fairly typical responses from nonprofit organizations. We really see anywhere from, you know, every two years to never. Um, and as far as best practices go, Lori mentioned earlier, we really do encourage clients to perform on uh, salary uh, benchmarking every two years about in order just to make sure they're in sync with the market. So as the market shifts, um, you know, some, some jobs increase you know, at a different level than um, the cost of living rate or whatever. So you do typically want to benchmark every couple of years to make sure that you're still paying in a way that aligns with um, your values. Yeah. And if I can add to that, I would say mm -hmm. you want to do your internal benchmarking annually and you want to do your external benchmarking yeah. every other year. Right. And so it's important yeah. internally to do that more frequently so that you have the equity. When people have questions, you can answer them um, and you can make sure that you're doing what you say you're going to do. Yeah. Thanks, Lori. So what exactly is benchmarking? Um, so we'll go back to the slide. Thanks, Omar. Um, and if you want to go to the next slide, we're going to talk a little bit about 
um, external equity and how you ensure that um, you do have equity. Um, so benchmarking is comparing your roles and the compensation you provide for those roles with that of others. Um, and that's how you assess your external equity. So there is a, a few different ways you can approach benchmarking. Uh, first, you can do primary research, uh, which is you know designing your own study, basically your own sample set, inviting other organizations to participate in your custom study, which can be challenging. Um, and you also have to articulate a value for those um, organizations that are participating in your study. So you know potentially sharing the results back with them or something um, like that that would um, make it worth it to them. Uh, the second way you can do this is by using a uh, salary survey. So um, a lot of times these are either paid or publicly available to you. Um, nonprofits typically get a better rate on these types of, of studies um, just because a lot of times nonprofits are, are the organizations doing the studies. Um, so again, they try to make it a little less costly for you to um, pay equitably. And then um, the third way is a combination of both primary research and the secondary research. Um, regardless of what method, though, uh, you need to be sure that you're actually um, starting with accurate and comparable data. So if the titles don't align with what people actually do, the results really won't be that meaningful. Um, we've definitely had clients, and, and this could be you, where you know, you've given titles out like candy. Um, so someone's an associate, someone's a director, someone's a manager, but they all do the same thing. Um, so aligning those titles is one of your first steps. Um, and then, you know, you want to make sure that your social media manager is doing similar work to other social media managers in the field and that those roles align. Um, and again, with you know, the way the world is now, um, you know, organizations are getting more and more creative with titles. So you may call someone, you know, a marketing guru, um, but they may be a marketing director out in the field. So you need to align, align those as well. Um, so you really do have to start with that job audit if you're not confident that your people have the right titles or your people are um, doing roles that reflect um, their job description. And when you start, um, when you do a, a job audit, you always need to involve your staff um, to make sure you get it right. So um, typically this is um, talking to each person, having them review their job description, looking at um, what's on there that they're still doing, what's on there that they no longer do, what they need to add to their job description. Um, and as Lori said earlier, you know, once a year is a good time to have these kinds of um, conversations where you're reviewing people's internal, um, you're reviewing the internal equity of your organization and you're reviewing people's uh, job titles and um, job descriptions to make sure that they're accurate. Um, yeah. And I would just say so, this is key. Oh. A lot of organizations don't think about that, but depending on what state you operate in, you're legally required to do that, particularly in California, right? The job description yeah. must be up to date. Um, and so this process allows you to make sure that you're being compliant with those types of regulations as well. Yes, exactly. And then um, it's really important to think about how you're going to use the results. So once you either do you know, your primary study and you get some responses back from organizations and you analyze the data or you buy those um, you know salary compensation studies from a nonprofit that completed it um, do you use those either you know internally with just HR in order to establish salary bands um, to establish salaries or to compare your bonus program um, or do you potentially share your results with staff um, or even, you know, a step further, do you share your um, your data and your analysis of each position with staff members that fall under those um, those job titles? So we definitely know organizations that provide employees with a chart each year 
um, that does show, you know, their external analysis that they did, how their salary compares with the market um, as reported, you know, on three different salary studies or as reported by, you know, five or six different peers. Um, or sometimes we have clients that share their full uh, cash value of all of their benefits, um, which kind of leads us into transparency and what all uh, data around salaries we share with our staff members. So I'm going to hand it over to Omar to talk about that. Right on. Thank you, Shaq. Appreciate it. So um, speaking about transparency, we had actually had a question in the Q&A about transparency, which uh, Lori did a great job answering, and uh, I will speak to as well in a moment. Um, but I want to start by getting a sense of what we mean by salary transparency and what kind of options exist. So uh, there are basically two contexts in which salary transparency tends to come up. It's when you're doing hiring and when you're looking within the organization. So uh, when you're hiring, and that's before we get to this uh, very beautiful graphic here, so you can just pretend it's not here for a second. So <laughs> we're talking about hiring, right? Uh, this is what you're already uh, having a sense of what we're talking about. You're posting the salary when you're posting the job. Sometimes it's just one number, sometimes it's a range, uh, and it's with the job description. Uh, and a lot of times it's uh, good to have some level of clarity around whether there's negotiation around that number. The more you're able to share uh, in terms of information with respect to uh, compensation, how you got there, etc., like that is great. Uh, uh, there might also be some potential for more compensation bonuses or things like that. Um, but it's important to have uh, your ducks in a row internally before you start start to share too much information on something like a job description. And so we'll talk about what that looks like. So let's take a look at this very beautiful graphic that we have here in front of us, um, the pay spectrum. Uh, and it, it's really a continuum. So uh, what uh, many of us have uh, started uh, our careers more likely than not and, and are used to is that uh, that beginning one uh, category one or two, that what or that how. Uh, and a lot of organizations are trying to move into the where and into the why. Uh, the woe is pretty rare. That's why we named it the woe. It's, it's not that common. And I'll talk about the circumstances in which we most likely will see it. But most organizations, uh, like as you know, aren't sharing everyone's exact salary with everyone else internally. So, uh, and it can be pretty challenging, like the copy machine story that uh, you heard in the beginning, which you'll hear the end of, of how we responded to uh, at the end. Uh, and it's particularly tricky when you have pay increases that are at the least partly uh, determined uh, by some sort of performance assessment. Oftentimes, that isn't as transparent how that performance assessment uh, uh, is calculated in there. Um, although it, it is true that there are some organizations that have uh, salaries that are aligned to a common scale and that will award bonuses as a reward uh, for exceptional performance instead of having that be baked into the, uh, the salary. Okay, so whatever it is that your advice is, uh, that, excuse me, whatever it is that your uh, strategy is currently and, and kind of where you want to be, uh, it starts with engaging staff in the conversation. So I, I want to talk a little bit about um, what we're seeing here in front of us. So the what. Uh, this is the very basic uh, situation which the majority of us have seen before, which is you find out what you as an individual get paid. Great. The next level up from there is the how level, the data market study. And so that's when an organization can say, here's how we can use market data to determine pay. The good thing about that is you're starting to now get some parity between your organization and similarly sized ones in the market. Next is where, and this is where you get to plan strategy uh, at pay ranges, and this is where your uh, pay falls uh, and where you can go. The important thing about um, this is that it not only says, here's what you get paid and here's how it compares to similar organizations in the field, but here's where it falls within the organization. And that is where the rubber really starts to hit the road because of some of the issues that um, we've been alluding to uh, earlier in the webinar. Next is the why level. So when organization is here, they have uh, uh, culture and manager training. And really the, the move here is 
having a level of rationale behind here's why we pay uh, like we do. Lori was uh, talking about one of the clients that we work with who had very specific and relatively low um, uh, pay in terms of what they were moving toward, but with a very specific rationale. And when that rationale is there, sometimes it's uh, that they allow much more flexibility than other organizations or the benefits package is structured uh, in one way or another. There's a variety of ways, but when that is really clear, when an organization can say why, that is uh, that great fourth level. And then the fifth level, that whoa, is when you have open salaries, uh, they're published, and the ranges as well uh, are published. And here's everything you want to know about everyone's pay. Very unusual because of the um, complexity involved with it, but uh, where you can most often see this is in either newer companies or companies that don't have a, a really long history where they're trying to justify or having to explain a lot of differences in compensation. And so this is actually uh, a place where if you're looking at developing countries, there are some developing countries that did not have the infrastructure for uh, landlines and went straight from having no phones to cell phones. Whereas uh, in developed countries, they went from having no phones to landlines to cell phones. Being able to uh, leap over some of these steps, if you're a newer company and you start with those open salaries, with those pub pub uh, published ranges, then it creates some of the, uh, it avoids some of the uh, issues that you may face if you're trying to do it uh, retroactively. So we are seeing it with newer organizations and smaller organizations as well. Let's hop into a Slido. Let's hop into the Slido. So if you follow this link, you're going to see the third question is now live. And that question is, are staff members allowed to choose among elements of their benefits package as in with a cafeteria plan? So folks are already seeing folks starting to chime in. Your options are yes, no, or I'm not sure. We have seven responses in. Two people thinking about how there's, a, boom, we have nine responses in and I'm gonna share the results in five, four, hold on to your hat, three, two, one. Let's take a look at these results. View results, bam. We have 56% uh, of folks saying no, staff members are not allowed to choose among elements of their benefits package with 44% saying yes. So uh, basically 60-40 split right around there. The majority are not, but there are some who do. We'll talk about uh, some of the uh, trade-offs and uh, nuances of that now as well. Let's hop back over here. I'm a one man band here. All right, here we go. <laughs> so uh, this is a really good one because on the one hand, you have to treat employees similarly or equally, right? Because you don't want to discriminate one versus the other. So you want to treat them equally. But the reality is you also know that there is not exactly a one size fits all that works for everybody because people's lives are different. So uh, some organizations have health and dental and vision insurance um, and will contribute a certain percentage or a set amount uh, toward each. But what if you had a certain dollar amount and you can contribute uh, uh, whatever amount toward health or dental or vision, depending on what the employee wanted. Or what if you reimbursed a certain amount for uh, home office expenses and you can choose how to do that. So there are different ways of structuring it, um, particularly if you use a, a, a cafeteria plan, also known as a section 125 plan. And this is where employees get a choice. They can uh, receive their compensation in cash or as part of an employee benefit. And there are different types of these kinds of plans. We won't go into detail, mostly because I'm not an expert in those, but I'm happy to uh, take your questions and pass them to someone who is. 
But the key thing to know is that this is a place where you can help increase your competitiveness in the market by just moving around the structure that you already have as opposed to um, having to really increase in a substantial amount the amount that you're contributing toward benefits. So whatever it is that you decide to do for benefits, uh, just make sure that you communicate that clearly. Communication is key in relationships, one-on-one -on -one relationships, and in organizational relationships like this. Initially, when you're making a change, as well as over time, because the reality is people forget. Uh, so uh, lastly, if you do allow for individualized benefit selection, it's important to uh, make that clear because uh, if you don't make that clear, again, early and often, uh, the reality is that someone uh, may uh, join your organization and then two years later, their life circumstance change and they may need those mental health services or the wellness benefits. Maybe there's a pandemic. Maybe they need some help because of that and they forgot that when they joined two or three years ago, you do have some of those benefits, the retirement matching, the commuter discounts. So um, ensuring that uh, your employees know uh, what your benefits are uh, frequently uh, can be really helpful. Now, one place where I've seen this work really well is during uh, uh, staff meetings where uh, everyone is together having uh, with some level of frequency, someone talk about uh, a time uh, in that period of time when one of the benefits has been helpful to them. So if you have an employee resource uh, group that has really been really helpful or uh, if someone uh, recently grew their family and they found that certain benefits were really helpful with respect to that, that level of transparency can also just help remind folks um, what you have. So. Here's what we have uh, in, in this graphic as well. We have uh, salary bands, we have uh, benefits, and we have negotiations, right? Uh, the degree to which any of this uh, can be negotiated and thus individuated uh, is something that you have to consider uh, because that's where you get uh, the bias come in, the, the, the more subjectivity there is to it. Um, so let's talk through this for a second. What is here? These are the kinds of questions that, that you see here that we will ask ourselves and we will ask our partners when we're thinking about structuring a compensation uh, package. And while you don't have to have these memorized, what they uh, indicate is that this has to be an individualized uh, kind of decision by organization. Because uh, if Importantly, not just uh, HR or um, your uh, people uh, team can say why it is that you're doing it, but importantly, if employees can say why it is that you're structuring your benefits the way that you are, then that's when you're going to be able to preempt a lot of the questions that folks have and a lot of the anxieties that they have about, am I being uh, treated fairly in this particular situation? Okay, let's take a look next at some of the lessons that we have learned as a firm with respect to uh, compensation. So um, there are there are three. The first is uh, this market-based exception. So this is a pretty common one. Let's say that you're uh, a, an advocacy organization and you're looking to hire an IT expert. And so they uh, you want to hire someone that is in the for-profit sector that's an IT expert to move over. And the reality is that the average salary of an IT expert uh, for the for-profit sector is going to be higher uh, than it is uh, for the nonprofit sector. So you increase the salary for this position, thus creating a market-based exception for the original salary offer. You can also see this with folks that are in legal, in finance, uh, and uh, some of these other uh, kinds of roles. Uh, next, we have promotions and backpedaling. These, these are going to get increasingly trickier. Promotions and backpedaling. Okay, so uh, some organizations, they grow incredibly uh, fast and uh, they may promote uh, their staff very, very quickly in terms of title and in terms of pay. Um, and so when an organization pauses, uh, they realize that, that this gro gro growth happened really, really quickly. And uh, it's hard to then decrease employees' pay or demote them. And so they need to think strategically about promotions in order to consider what makes sense in the context of growth. When this happens, oftentimes you have kind of a Wild West era and then a period of time where uh, the organization is creating more and more structure. And the reality is just being honest, being transparent about what is going on and, and why uh, things are uh, the way that they are works much better than uh, what can happen, which is talking behind the scenes. Uh, uh, folks trying to figure it out and uh, creating a culture where uh, they feel like uh, the lack of transparency means that there's something more sinister going on. And lastly, um, 
uh, waiting to, uh, too long to act. Uh, so uh, if a staff member accidentally receives access to payroll, like the copy machine story, um, uh, it can lead to a problem. Uh, if a, a staff member posts uh, their salary to social media, uh, we also actually saw this uh, uh, years ago uh, at Google, uh, where a staff member uh, decided to create uh, a shared um, spreadsheet with their salary and uh, encouraged others to do so as well on the internet uh, of Google, creating uh, incomplete but complete enough sense of what people's salaries were. And that brought up a lot of questions because at that point, Google had waited too long to act uh, in order to uh, address uh, compensation philosophy and why they were uh, doing what they were doing. At this point, um, I want to ensure that we have enough time for questions. And so we're going to um, skip best practices, take a quick look. I'm not going to talk about it, but take a quick look. Okay, now moving on to Q&A. This is what you really want. You want to be able to ask us questions. And so uh, we're going to move over to q and I'm going to hand it to Lori for um, this next piece. Hello, all. Wanted to answer your questions. There's a couple that came in over chat that we answered. Um, if there are others, please type them in. There's one I'm actually in the middle of typing an answer to. Very provocative question. Lori, if it's, this is Abby. If it's the question about whether or not to share salaries in the job posting, I feel like that's a super hot topic right now that I would love to hear you guys speak about for a second or two. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I'm basically, I'm giving, I'm giving you an answer that is sort of turning it back on you, right? Because essentially what I would say, the question was, there's some debate in the sector about whether including salary and job postings improves or inhibits equity, right? What's our guidance on that? Um, and so our guidance is that it really depends on the organization, right? If you're one of those organizations that are at the woe phase, then you know including the the salary on your job description isn't going to change anything for you but if you're all the way at the pay phase or you know you're only at even level two or three then that's going to have some huge implications for you internally that means that there's a lot of information potentially that you're now communicating externally that you haven't communicated internally right and so there's a mismatch there and it's almost the same thing as you know you're essentially voluntarily leaving your pay scale on the copy machine and not talking to anybody about it right and so it is a complex and nuanced question that is whose answer is unique to the institution you sit in and unfortunately in this era of sort of memes and like quick sound bites and like tweets um and the fact that we are all social justice warriors in some form or fashion right it's hard to get into the complexities of that conversation at a sort of mass level. Would you add anything, Omar, Shaq, on that one? Yeah, what I would say is that at, a, at an initial level, uh, it does help to um, uh, increase or improve uh, equity because oftentimes the structure that um, promotes equity depends on having that kind of information being obscured, but in the mid and the long term may not actually lead to a perfectly equitable uh, situation because what oftentimes happens is that power will just adjust. And uh, whether it's because you have uh, types of roles, like we talked about the market-based roles that tend to uh, call for more until you still have demographic differences in who's taking up certain roles, or because the uh, uh, other parallel processes like promotions or manager training isn't then also equally uh, strengthened along with uh, pay transparency, then you may have uh, uh, inequality, but just in a different form later on. Yeah, great question. It's what everybody's talking about. We talk about it internally all the time and we're all, you know, if you polled our entire organization, there would be a lot of different perspectives there. That's great. I know we're, people are talking about it a lot right now. We want to be equitable. We want to be transparent. And, but it's part of it being transparent publicly, but you also have to have that being transparent internally to balance it out is what I'm taking away from this. Mm -hmm. Great. Very good point that maybe we hadn't been thinking about before. I have another question that was coming in um, really about the hiring market right now and how much turnover is happening and people really being forced, if that's the right word, or feeling 
their hand force that they need to ha offer higher salaries right now because the tiring market is so tight. And how, from your experience, have you seen organizations, how to successfully manage that? Wouldn't it be lovely if we could just raise salaries to what everybody needed across the whole organization, but how to manage that when you might have had a vision going in and then really to fill your slots, you're being pushed. Yeah, I've got thoughts here, but Shaq, Omar, you guys want to take the lead and getting us started? I can jump in. I mean, I'll just say that this is a tough question and it's one that many organizations are going through right now. Um, and some of our clients are having to raise salaries in order to even hire um, to get people to apply um, because of how crazy this job market and economy is. So you're not alone. Um, it doesn't make it any easier though. Yeah. And are, are you finding that if people have to, if they have to offer an, a new hire, a higher salary, are they then trying to compensate across their organization that way? Or are they just explaining it away? Or what advice would you give us? <laughs> yeah, there's definitely implications for that. I mean, um, you know, the market is, uh, there's, there's a lot of transition in the marketplace. And many candidates in the market are very clear about what they need to make a transition and to be happy doing so. And not many of them are willing to negotiate on that. Um, and the truth of the matter is that there's enough vacancies that they, the candidates are able to find homes, right? Um, and so what that means is this could have some implications for you internally, particularly if you have a key role that you must fill and it's, you know, the organization has no option but to fill that. And at varying times, that is the case. If you sort of have a hot job, you know, sometimes you, you have to make that determination. Um, and then you have to sort of go back and look at your compensation structure and you have to have those internal conversations and talk with the organization and your team around, you know, share that rationale, share the real life challenge, right? Um, this is complex stuff, a little bit messy. Um, and, and you just have to acknowledge that and then talk about what your goals are and to the extent that you can and you are able to shift uh, your compensation and to sort of bring everyone in alignment, you do that. Uh, but more often than not, there's also a ton of ways to really be creative about how you can compensate a new person that is sort of somewhat outside of the compensation structure. So for example, you know, your compensation structure might require someone to be within a particular range, but the real realities of the market is you can't hire somebody without giving them an additional $20,000. Well, that does not have to be in salary. It could be in the form of benefits. It could be in a stipend. It could be in a, a performance-based bonus, right? And that then becomes something that you as an organization are not required to continue in the future. Right. And so, you know, there's a lot of different ways to address that challenge um, and, you know, conversation with the candidate and also conversation, you know, and being creative with your compensation, compensation structure can allow for that. That's really helpful. Um, I want to acknowledge that we're a, little, a couple minutes past three o'clock. We had planned to wrap up at three o'clock. There are a couple more questions that if you all are available, I'd love to still ask and have a couple more minutes of conversation. Um, yeah. For anybody who's in the audience, we'll record this. You can watch the very end if you have to run. We'd love to have you stay. And also, if you'd like to raise your hand, we could bring you on the screen with us and you can join the conversation too. So we're happy to have you do that. Um, I One of the other questions was about being a small nonprofit organization and having both full-time employees and freelancer or consultant staff and how to how to even approach an equity or strategy around that. I'm smiling because there's so many organizations that are like, we want to do this compensation analysis, but we have these freelancers and part-time workers who we're just not going to think about right now. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so that happens often, right? And, you know, it's, it's easier to focus on the people who you see every day and who, you know, are going to be asking these questions. Um, but the best compensation strategies take that into account. And they're looking at sort of what's that rate of pay if you were to, to convert that part-time or freelance person to full-time, um, it, it doesn't continue to be equitable, right? There are also really clear differences in, um, you know, what compensation is like for a consultant, say, you know, versus and somebody who's doing sort of short-term work versus someone who's doing part-time work. Right. So taking into account. So what are our what are our values around that? Right. You are, in essence, sort of paying that person to 
you know, not look at other opportunities for that time. And there's implications for that. And that has a value, right? And so making sure that your compensation structure is clear about what that value is and how you calculate it. Um, but, you know, one of the things I think you've heard us say in multiple different ways is that alignment is key, right? Um, and so you can't have sort of two structures that aren't aligned and sort of don't speak to each other. Um, but that doesn't mean that differences aren't allowed, but you've got to have clear rationale for that. It's best if you know how to explain that, if you can get in front and be more transparent around it, you know, rather than being defensive and answering questions. Because by the time you get to questions, um, someone has, has sort of built up their courage to ask you that question. But before then, they have come to many different conclusions right? Um, and so if you, can, if you can be part of that conversation before they come to their own conclusions and wonderings, that's better. Great. Yeah. Um, I see one came in in the Q&A um, when you're sharing the ranges for the first time with staff. Um, well, I, any tips, one, and secondly, uh, how do you communicate with employees who may fall even above the range set for their role? I can speak to this piece. So um, the first one is I, I want to answer both questions at the same time. I, and I want to start by naming um, that Megan said that um, their organization has issues articulating policies and work they're doing around setting compensation policies and structures. I'd like to hear what those challenges are, what those issues are, because that's going to help drive what the solution is. But there are two pieces to these questions. One, what happens if the staff is small? And then two, how do you, any tips for exactly what you said, Abby, communicating this in the first place? So whether the staff is small or large, the process is broadly the same. Uh, and it's uh, we actually find that the staff size or the organization size does it isn't the main driver. Uh, it uh, oftentimes is what is the uh, historical precedent around this work, um, and that's really going to help drive uh, what the approach is going to be. Because if it's the first time that you ever broached the subject with staff versus if it's a sore spot that has uh, come up before, then we're going to be approaching it differently. Uh, and then secondly, with how is it that uh, you talk about this? Uh, there. What's helpful to, to know is that at the executive levels, uh, when you're talking about executive directors or some of the highest paid uh, staff in an organization, their compensation is published in a 990. And so th it is public information. And yet, uh, year over year, these roles are being filled. So just having the number out there of what did the previous person make in the role, um, having that be an expectation makes it so that in terms of process, uh, that actually doesn't tend to come up a lot as an issue or a challenge when you're trying to fill those roles again. It's in this transition phase and going from we've never shared this information before to now we're sharing it and you have all of these uh, implications, people that may fall above the range or below the range. And then uh, the reality being that when that happens, oftentimes there is, it's because there's a, a large amount of Subject, subjective choice that someone had in determining what that number is going to be. Sometimes that's because of a really good reason that we wanted to get Abby. She was working at this other organization where she was making X. We really wanted her to do this work. And she called for X, which was $20,000 higher than we were budgeting, but she was the right person. And so we, we wanted to bring her along. And having Abby in our organization has really made the difference, which is great. But when that's the case and you uh, extend that uh, person after person, who's getting the benefit of the doubt that we should be extending more money toward them or not? That's when you see all kinds of biases. So how should you address it? Two ways. Number one, uh, and there's this pat answer is not going to fit every situation, but number one, it's to the extent that you can be transparent around what the philosophy was, even if it was not one that was articulated articulating it and say when in the first five years of our organization we were just trying to survive bring on good people and keep them and now we're getting to the point where we have levels and and structures that are calling for something different so you may find that uh, there are some folks whose salaries may be above or below the uh, market range and this is how we're addressing it uh, oftentimes if it's above you're just you, the, the organizations will don't do anything and if it's below then they will actually pay uh, to fill that gap um, but then secondly, it's in saying not just here, here's how we come into the numbers. It's not just a math problem. This is as much about the head as it is about the heart saying, here's, uh, here's the reasoning why here's what we want to see for you. And here's what we think about this for you because compensation 
as we said in the very beginning, and it should not be lost, is not just the salary amount, the um, ability to work remotely, the kind of benefits that you have. These things really do truly drive uh, someone's decision to stay in a role. And particularly now where you have people that are starting and leaving roles where they're completely online and they haven't met their colleagues, oftentimes those relationships can be uh, glue that keeps people in a role for a longer period of time. I don't want to leave Lori. We have our weekly lunches and I, I met her babies and the whole thing. That can keep someone in the role. And when you don't have that anymore, you have to be really, really sharp with uh, what it is that your philosophy uh, toward compensation is or else people are going to leave. Great, thank you. There was another question out there about um, moving from a cost per living increases, salary raises to a more merit-based increase program. And I wondered if you all have thoughts about when and how we should consider raises and shifting from one strategy to another one. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to start off here. I would say that um, so merit-based increases, you're gonna have to have a really um, well communicated and understood performance evaluation process and definition of what sort of merit means and the different ways that a person can demonstrate that. Um, you're going to have to have really good tracking and recording of the evidence of that merit because people will ask, well, I know this person, they don't seem to be working very hard. Why did they get a raise and I didn't? Right. Um, and so you're going to have those types of conversations and, you know, people and then, you know, there's there are organizations in the woe phase where they're open and they're sharing people's performance evaluation. Right. That's something that people know so they can see for themselves. Um, so you got to think about transparency as it relates to that. I think, you know, I would just piggyback a little bit off of what Omar said, which is, you know, whether. You know, the the decision to have the structure shouldn't be sort of the starting point in the conversation, right? Um, if, if your leadership team is making this decision sort of in a vacuum, I think you're gonna end up having many more conversations than you anticipate. And so I would recommend um, sort of beginning to have some conversations, educating your organization on different approaches to compensation talking about the advantages, disadvantages of them, you know, how that benefits organizations and institutions, why one or more might be, you know, better for your institution, really getting them to understand the topic because not many people do, um, getting their input, you know, having them talk through what they think is good or bad about a particular approach. You're gonna learn a lot there, right? That's gonna help you figure out how do I communicate this change? And how do I communicate in a way that's going to make people feel safe and comfortable? Um, and then, you know, then then you'll want to get that feedback and say, you know, we've, we've listened to all of you. We've gone on this learning journey together. Here's what we're thinking. What do you think? Let's have some focus groups. Let's look at a couple of sort of proposals that we're thinking and get your feedback on that and sort of build something together. Um, if there is not strong trust between supervisors and their staff, a merit-based approach is gonna be very difficult. There's a lot of training that's gonna go into um, a process like that. It's not something that you can say, you know, it's September, we're gonna develop this and we'll implement it in January. You know, this is a process that you are probably gonna to need to invest a year in to do really well. And you can roll it out in 2023. And people hate that. They come to us and they're like, can't you come here and solve our problems in three months? I got three months worth of time to give you to do this, to develop a compensation structure. And it's so hard because we say we can get you here, right? Or we can do it. We can do it because we can be you in a vacuum and do it. But you are not going to like the outcome. Right? You guys, thank you so much. You have given us so much to think about. I mean, I have lots of different one word's popping in my head or three words, intentionality, inclusion, transparency, all, communication, all these great approaches. So I really appreciate all three of you, Omar, Shaquille, and Lori, and on behalf of the Nonprofit Alliance and everyone here today, I wanna say, say thank you. Thank you for your time and thank you for all the work that you're helping all of us do to be more equitable. Thank you. It was Thank our pleasure. You. And if you have more questions, please connect with Jen. She'll be able to support you and get the information that you need.
great. Thank you all very much. Thanks. Have a good rest of your day. Thank you.